سیاست در قبال ایران ماشه و تحریم و ضرورت حسابرسی از رژیم اجلاس فوقلاده در ده هزار نقطه در دو سوی آتلانتیک سخنان رابرت جوزف کلیایوت و جولیو ترتزی در آستانه اجلاس مجمع عمومی سازمان ملل متحد This is Rajavi. It is a real honor to join with you once again in your heroic and historic fight for a free Iran. Let me uh, begin by thanking our friends at Ashraf 3 who are with us today. You and your brothers and sisters inside Iran, the resistance units, are the true beacons of freedom. For over a generation, You have endured unspeakable sufferings at the hands of the regime as you stood up for your values, democracy, human rights, equality of the sexes, and a secular republic where sovereignty resides with the people, not with the corrupt ruling class. Your sacrifices and your success will inspire the next generation in Iran and, tr and truly everywhere where freedom is valued. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifices. Thank you for your continuing fight for freedom. As I've mentioned before, each year I feel closer to the goal of a free Iran. The end of the religious dictatorship is in sight. Russia cannot save the mullahs by providing advanced arms. China cannot save them by providing economic assistance, which surely will come at a high price. Even the West, if it were sadly to unite once again in pursuit of failed policies of appeasement, cannot save the, re the religious dictatorship from its ultimate fate. The people of Iran are rising up and will not be satisfied until the regime is relegated in the words of Ronald Reagan, to the ash heap of history. Today, we are at a crossroads. The future of Iran will be greatly influenced by actions and decisions taken over the course of the next months. Perhaps significant are three interrelated and I believe converging factors that have or will have a fundamental impact for years to come. Let me just pose these three factors as questions. First, will snapback sanctions be imposed on the regime? As we know, the United States pulled the trigger on the UN snapback provision uh, due to Iran's violations of the JCPOA, violations that are documented by the IAEA, violations that no one questions, not even the regime. In fact, the regime openly acknowledges the violations in order to gain and coerce more concessions from the remaining parties of the treaty, particularly the uh, American allies, Germany, France, and the UK. Nevertheless, while the governments are likely to stick to that position, that UN sanctions have not been reimposed by the US action, the practical effect of the US stack back may be that, uh, that the companies uh, the, of, of Europe and elsewhere, the foreign companies, are nevertheless deterred or dissuaded from conducting business with Iran. If the U.S. is willing to fully enforce sanctions on foreign companies doing business with Iran, which is what the Trump administration has said it intends to do, these companies will have a simple choice. Will they do business with the United States or will they do business with Iran? And I think the answer is obvious. It was obvious in 2018 when the United States opted out of the nuclear agreement, and it's obvious now. Second, and I think this is likely the 800-pound gorilla question, 
what will U.S. policy be on Iran in the next administration? Either a Biden administration or a Trump second term. After the election, the United, will the United States maintain a policy of maximum pressure? Or will the West, under U.S. leadership, return to policies of appeasement in the hope that the regime will reform, that it will become more moderate, and that it will abide by the rules of the international order? Something that the West so dearly wants to believe applies to all nations. But this hope, as we all know, is nothing but a fantasy. Proven wrong again and again, the result has always been just the opposite. Appeasement and conciliation prolong the regime, providing resources for its continuing aggression and its repression of the Iranian people who are, as we all know, the foremost victims of the regime. The third question is, can the regime overcome its domestic vulnerabilities? And here I think the answer is a clear and resounding no. Iran's economy is in free fall, free fall, driven to bankruptcy by corruption, incompetence, and the sanctions imposed on the regime for its support for terrorism, its pursuit of nuclear weapon, and its foreign aggressions. Collectively, these efforts have robbed the Iranian people of their prosperity. And the mullahs know that the people will never forgive them for their role in the deaths of tens of thousands from the coronavirus pandemic, a scourge that continues to ravage the, the country. The mullahs have lost all legitimacy. The Iranian people are now the greatest threat to the regime. The mass killings across Iran are acts of desperation. The recent Amnesty International report punctuated by the tragic and despicable hanging of Navid Afkari, the championship wrestler falsely accused and coerced demonstrates for the whole world the atrocities of the regime, the barbaric torture and the flagrant murder of those seeking a free Iran. So what lies ahead? One path is to return to failed policies, the failed policies of the path, uh, of the past, a path that is often characterized as a choice between diplomacy over war, but we know this is a masquerade. We know it's a false choice, demonstrated by the fact that we have not gone to war in the more than two years since the United States opted out of the JCPOA. And we know that the agreement did not lead to a more moderate Iran. In fact, the regime took the billions of dollars it gained, and what wasn't siphoned off through corruption was used to fund foreign aggression, terrorism, and internal repression. The central problem is not the absence of an agreement. The central problem is not the absence of negotiations. More agreements will only lead to more aggression and more brutality. The problem is the regime, the regime itself, a regime that will never abandon its quest for a nuclear weapon, its support for terrorism, or its use of terror and murder to achieve its objectives. The second path, the right path, of course, is to continue maximum pressure on the regime. Here, we must not throw the regime a lifeline by pursuing fatally flawed agreements in exchange for more old false promises. And we must deny the regime any legitimacy by telling the truth and by keeping the focus on its reign of terror over the past 40 years. Most important, we must support the democratic opposition outside and inside Iran at the end of the day, it's the Iranian people who will determine their own future. It is their destiny to determine. And it is the NCRI, the MEK, and Mrs. Rajavi who provide the necessary vision for an effective to a secular, non-nuclear, democratic, and free Iran. Thank you very much for all you do.